FM News Talk 97.1. On Demand Audio. Kevin Lace, man, thank you so much for joining us. I know you've had a really hugely busy morning. And, of course, Kevin Lace, SEAL Team 3. He is the author of The Last Punisher, a SEAL Team 3 sniper's true account of the Battle of Ramadi, which was just unbelievable. Kevin, thank you so much for being with us, my friend. Jamie, thanks for having me on. And thank you so much for your service. And I want to let you know, my son, Ethan, is a huge fan of yours. He is an Army engineer. He was at the Army Reserves in Iraq in 2009, 2010. And guys like you who came before him just absolutely made it much easier. War is never easy. But it was that much easier thanks to the work that you and Chris Kyle and the rest of your team did to try to secure Iraq. So thank you very much for that on behalf of my son and on behalf of all of my listeners. Thank you for your service, my friend. Jamie, I appreciate that. And please tell your son thanks for his service. And, you know, that's the one thing that, you know, one of the main things we want to convey in this book is, you know, you remember that old commercial, BASF? We don't make a lot of the products you buy. We make a lot of the products you buy better. You know, SEALs can't win Ramadi. They can't win Fallujah alone. They can't win any of these things alone. And we worked in conjunction with the Marines, with the Army. You know, we had a, um, a reserve unit out of Kentucky that we did a lot of work with, and it was together. It was that shared sacrifice that helped win that city. So, you know, I, I have so many fond memories working with the Army, the Marines. Um, and it, when you get overseas, all those inter-service rivalries kind of go away and evaporate. You know what the true mission is, and you guys work together. So I appreciate my time with everybody I worked with. Well, no doubt. Let's go back to the very beginning, though, because I think this says a lot about who you are, and I'm sure there are many stories like this. So you were at James Madison University. The year is 2000, and then suddenly the terrorist attacks happen, September 11, 2001, and your good friend's father died in that attack. Correct. Yeah, I was at James Madison, and, and you know, as you read the book, you realize I was uh, excelling in everything but school. So I was, you know, a borderline student. Uh, my parents weren't exactly thrilled, but the nine eleven attacks really changed my world as it did everyone else who's listening right now. Um, and I realized I needed to do something different. My friend's father was killed in the Trade Center, um, and I was lacking direction. And I didn't aspire to be a SEAL my entire life, but after nine eleven, I knew. The military was the option. I actually went to the Marine Corps office to, uh, you know, see a recruiter, and they were they're out to lunch. Uh, so I went to a Navy office, saw a poster, and it was a bunch of frogmen wielding machine guns with huge caterpillar mustaches, uh, and I was like, I want to do that, and that's uh, kind of got the ball rolling. Yeah, and it was it was a tough road too. Ultimately, as we wind up in uh, Iraq and 2006, and let's begin with uh, your friend, your colleague, your comrade Mark Lee, and you all were in a house clearing operation. Not only were you obviously uh, working on a variety of levels as a sniper as well, but you're also a medic, and you cared for your dear friend Mark Lee. Yeah, you know, um, writing the book uh, wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to tell the story that you know I basically almost dropped out of college um you know it was wasn't easy telling a lot of these stories you know the first time you actually uh, exercise some long range target interdiction on the enemy um and it wasn't easy telling the story of august 2nd when we lost uh, mark lee and ryan job was also injured um on that same day and what you walk away from with this book and what i wanted to convey is not just these are my stories, listen to them. It's to put people in the moment and understand why when you talk to a service member, they hold those memories so sacred of the brotherhood they shared with the men and women they served with um, because it's powerful. You know, they're experiences that a select part of the population has, um, and they're special. They're special to us, and they're special to everyone else if they care to listen. And, you know, caring for Mark is um, one of those, is one of the lowest days I've ever ex- experienced, but at the same time, I know Mark left me with the power to do whatever because to care for your brother when he's down on the ground um, in a dirty house in Iraq, um, you know, it doesn't get any harder than that. And able to walk out with the rest of my brothers, um, you know, is really strengthening, and that's what Mark Lee left me with. And you account how you carried Mark's body through enemy gunfire, and it was just a tough time all around. And speaking of being left with something, you were also left with the nickname Dauber, and you were given that by Chris Kyle. What did that mean? Um, well, this was back in the day before there were cell phones and smartphones, and I walked into the platoon space at SEAL Team 3, and as soon as I walked in, um, I got the moniker, the nickname Dauber, 
And I didn't know what that was because I wasn't a big coach fan, you know, TV show coach. <laughs> yeah. So I had to go look it up on the Internet on a computer, and I saw who it was, and it was a big, goofy, you know, assistant coach. And I was like, great. It could be worse. The nickname could have been worse, and I've heard worse. Um, but it stuck like glue, and to this day, you know, everybody calls me Dauber. You know, and when you were recounting the story, too, just to going back for a second to, to with Mark Lee, I, we look at this book and we look at your actions. We look at the actions of all of the SEAL teams. And, and, and we also see what happened recently in Dallas. And we are now just hearing stories about the heroism of the police officers, the Dallas police officers, when gunfire was erupting. And they instinctively, it seems, just started to protect everybody and dive over everybody, cover people and get people behind cars and cover them with their own weaponry to, 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 protect them and i'm i it reminds me that boy you're out in the field here you're out in the field of battle and what is it that drives you is it is it instinct what what is it that i mean that that keeps you from just running you know what i'm saying because 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 some of us of weaker cores wouldn't be able to handle this so what is it i think we all have it you know it's innate we just need to find a situation that brings it out um, you know, we reference uh, Lieutenant Dave Grossman, you know, the author, author of On Killing, and he talks about sheep and sheepdogs. I think we all have a little sheepdog in us, um, you know, more so those the people that go into the military or law enforcement or first responders. But, you know, I had an interview the other day, and somebody's like, well, you know, people hate you, you know, and talking about military members that go overseas and do this job or, you know, even if it's law enforcement. Um, but they need us. And you look, as soon as the gunfire happened in Dallas, you know, people were jumping behind cops to protect them. And they stood up regardless of what the protest was, and they protected the people around them. So the sheepdogs will always stand up. We all have it within ourselves. We just need to find that situation um, to... uh, to um, show it, display it. And I think sometimes when we read books like The Last Punisher or we see movies that you're involved in, like American Sniper, and I'll get to that in a second, I think sometimes not only is it an accounting of what you went through, but it is also inspiring. I think I think when people read a book like this or hear your story, they check themselves and they say, can I stand up? And will I be able to stand up? Would I stand up? And you say the answer would be usually yes, as long as we just read and hear. Absolutely. You know, I, there's an entertainment factor with The Last Punisher. There's some great stories. But I want, when somebody picks up this book, this book to say, hey, you know, I've been in a bad situation, and I want to turn my life around. I'm going to read this story, and that's where I can extrapolate from it. Or, you know, I'm a spouse of a military veteran, and my husband or wife doesn't really convey to me what they've experienced over in Iraq. And the way we wrote this was to get you into the shoes, into the mindset of what you go through. It's it's visceral, it's grim, it's vivid, it's raw, but you know after you read it what people experience. Um, and for other veterans that get out and they're like, what can I do? Well, I want them to pick this book up and say, hey, I've gone through these experiences. Anything is possible. I've done worse. I can translate that into success on, you know, after my military service. So it, it reaches a wide audience, um, but there's a lot of themes that it can relate to a lot of people. Now, you were originally a technical advisor, Kevin, with uh, the American Sniper movie to Bradley Cooper, and how did that transform into a a role for you? That wasn't originally planned, correct? No, it wasn't. I was on the range with a fellow frogman of mine, uh, my buddy Rick, and I was training Bradley, and about an hour into it, he said, why don't you play yourself in the movie? Because Dauber was a character. <clears throat> and I told him, I was like, well, you know, let's get Chris's character correct, and then we can uh, worry about myself. And he kept pestering me. And I went back to North Carolina because I was in the middle of Wake Forest grad school. And um, I got an email from the casting director with a set of sides. My wife and I videotaped them on an iPhone, sent them into Jeff Micklack, the casting director, and then he sent it to Clint. And Clint came back with, boys, damn good, get him a job. <laughs> and um, that, the rest, as they say, is history. And I got on uh, American Cyber, but it was not planned. I love it. I just I just saw the sign here that they said I wanted to, they wanted me to wrap this up by eight nineteen. So I'm sorry to take you further. I just want to mention one thing. You mentioned your wife, uh, Lindsay, and and she helped you with the book. And from uh, from all accounts, it seems like she and you. I mean, this is she's a rock for you, correct? She's awesome. You know, with Ethan Rocky and Lindsay. Lindsay brought the um, she brought the emotion to it. Uh, you know, as a high school you know history teacher, when I'd write this stuff, she's like, "Give me more emotion here. What's going on? What are you feeling? What are you thinking?" And that really. Breathe a lot of life into the book. 
Kevin Lace, thank you so much. Thank you absolutely for your service. Thank you for your time. Tell your people, I'm sorry I took you a little further. I didn't see that. And I appreciate you and, and all that you've done for this country and for our military and for our hearts and minds, buddy. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, sir. All right, that is Kevin Lace. He is the author of The Last Punisher, a SEAL Team 3 Con.